I think we've got everybody from the waiting room. Uh-oh. There we go. Marabelle has started recording? Yes. Yes. Okay. Shall I start? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. On behalf of the parent committee at Temple Near to Mead, we're thrilled to be co-hosting tonight's living room chat with Montclair Bounce. We're living in unprecedented times with COVID, and Nancy Kislin has kindly offered to speak with us once again and offer support to our community during this challenging time. Nancy Kislin is a licensed clinical social worker, marriage and family therapist, and parenting coach. She is a leading expert with over 30 years of experience in helping parents, educators, and communities cultivate resilience in kids in, a, in an age of uncertainty. Nancy Kislin has extensive training in cognitive behavioral uh, to work with patients facing challenges with depression, anxiety, family issues, life cycle issues, and bereavement. Nancy is the author of Lockdown, Talking to Your Kids About School Violence. She has shared guidance and informed perspective to various audiences through published articles, speaking engagements, and has her own practice in Chatham, New Jersey. So without further delay, I would like to introduce Nancy Kislin to take the floor. Everyone will be muted, but you can ask specific questions on the chat function that will be visible to Nancy. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. How are you? Oh my goodness, you can see my wallpaper that's falling down. I didn't know that until I did so in town. Okay, so everybody is here and I'm so grateful that you took time out of this beautiful day. And I think that is such an example of sort of this unbelievable time we're living in where we think we can be, at least I thought I prepped, I planned, I even put on lipstick for the first time in a week. And then whoops, something else happened. And this certainly is a time of creativity and resilience. So I'm so looking forward to spending the next 45 minutes hour with you all. And I really encourage you to use the chat box because I can see it too. And I wanna hear from you. I wanna know what brought you here tonight. Before we get started, I always like to start with, let's take a few deep breaths. And if you're comfortable, you can close your eyes. I welcome you to close your eyes. And just feel yourself if you're sitting Feel yourself sitting on the chair. Feel your feet pushing into the ground. And use your breath in and out to ground you. What do I mean by grounding? It means use our breath to bring ourselves back into our body. And of course, we have all these thoughts always running around in our head. But our breath is the most powerful tool to help interrupt all the noise and help us ground and come in our body. So with that, take a few deep breaths in and out. And this, and I could talk forever about mindful techniques, but this is such a good thing. I try to do it at least three to five times a day where I literally spend, even if it's just three minutes, just stop, breathe. How am I doing, Nancy? What do you need, Nancy? Just like we would want ourselves to be parented, do that to yourself. Because now, I'm sorry, more than ever, we so need to be grounded. We so, and maybe that's too hard to be grounded, but just to have these moments of, okay, I'm present with myself. I'm available to all the people. So if you can, and want to. Can you all type in real quick the ages of your kids so I get a sense of how old everyone is? Uh, your, your kids, sorry. All I can, I'm so distracted by the wallpaper. I'm going to do this and see if it helps. Does that help? No! <laughs> it's going to drive me insane. Okay, so we have 
Seven year old, 12, five and a half, nine, 11, 10, 10. So kind of seven across the board. This, and you keep bringing it on, it, help, it helps me make sure I help you. So as we go back to sort of where are we in this moment in time? And right before I came in here to do this, uh, breaking news came across the TV and I, I'm not sure I can even say it, but we hit 100,000 deaths in our country. And I don't know about you, but that's more than my mind can compute. That's so much loss that I don't think any of us can really begin to process. And a term I use these days is collective trauma, that we're all going through this collective trauma together. And we don't really know what that means. And we don't know the long-term cost of all this. But when I look through that language, uh, I, excuse me, when I look through that lens and the lens, um, you were so nice to mention my book, Lockdown. Who knew a year and a half ago when my book was published that lockdown would have this whole new universal meaning and how unbelievable it is to me that I spent two years of my life hyper-focused on trauma and how traumatic certain events can be to children and how developmentally challenging it can be and what I can help you as parents and grandparents do to help your children. So the last couple of months, I've been really working with parents and kids and using that lens that I already bring to look through how do we help our children now while we're in this place of collective trauma? And what can I bring to the table that can help you help your children now so that when we do get through this, they are the most resilient. They are in the most amazing place that they can be. Is that a high order and a challenge? Yes. Do I want that to feel like I'm putting more stress on you? Absolutely not. I want you to remember that you're not in this alone. And that's sort of the unbelievableness of this is that we're all in this together. So do you, do you, does that term resonate with you, the collective trauma? Does that feel, I can see a few heads, so yeah. So let's get started by talking about how do you start to help your children? And so important, and I'll just say it because it's so obvious, but everyone's child has different needs. If you have more than one child, you know one child might need one thing one day, and a week from now, your other child demands this. So knowing that everything I say can be taken in different ways because you know your child, and because of the unusualness of what we're going through, it's fair to say that your child needs change and that we need to be as flexible as we possibly can. So being flexible means how are you doing? Because for me to say to you, hey, I need you to be really flexible. I need you to be present with your kid sort of has a lot of nerve when I don't first check in with you and see how you are doing. So anyone wanna share sort of in the chat box, sort of are you struggling to just get through the day? Is it the schoolwork just you're done with? It's almost June and we've just had enough. Any comments are welcome. So when I ask, how are you doing? I always follow up with, hey, let me see if I can help you create space, even if it's just this very little window in time, can I help you create space to help you in your self-care? So in a perfect world, you would have time for exercise and eating right and getting enough sleep. Uh, last night when I was walking, I saw one of my neighbors who has three little ones and a full-time job. And she says she's going to bed at 4 a.m. and gets up at 7 every day with her baby. How long can she sustain that? And how 
it's not healthy for her, but it's also not healthy for her kids. So if she was one of you or she wanted my input or she was one of my clients, I would help her look at where can we massage that schedule because that is a recipe for disaster. So some people are sharing, they feel pulled in lots of directions between work, kids, school, volunteer commitments struggling with kids who are not motivated for schoolwork. Uh, just so much juggle and struggle, right? Juggle and struggle. And I'm sure there's a lot of us out there that feel this, like, I don't know about you, but I feel it usually here or here. And usually our body is a way when we feel physical symptoms or sensations, our body saying, hey, so I, offer this as a suggestion is, I want you in the next couple of days to think back on this talk and think about how you can add just, maybe it's just one little piece to your routine of how you can support yourself in this time. Maybe it's taking a shower at the end of the day after the kids are asleep and you just take a relaxing shower and use some lavender oil and put cream on your face and put the intention that this is good for me and I'm nourishing myself. Just having that little space is great. The other thing I highly, highly recommend, and I don't know why, but a lot of people don't like it, is having a journal. Every child I'm working with right now and every family and every adult that I work with, I urge everyone to keep a journal. And a journal can be, I keep this little, very old little brown book that you can see has had a lot of love. And I go through a lot of them, but I sometimes just jot down words because time is of the essence. Today, May 27th, anxious, pit in my stomach, going for a walk, right? And then I'll go to, I always keep these, I highly recommend, loose sleeve, the old fashioned loose sleep, and then I'll journal in there. And even if I don't have time to write out as much as I'd like, I think it's so healthy because when we get through this, which we all will, that we look back and say, we have a journal. We have a way to mark this time. And so important for kids. And for some of you who have the younger kids, you you can invite them to do the journal with you. And maybe instead of writing, if they're not into that, have some colored pencils, crayons, and that you can kind of like, hey, what was one of the highs from the day? What was something we enjoyed this week? And let it kind of be this arts and crafts kind of journal if that works more for your kids. So let's get now kind of more into the meat. So yes, creating time for you. And I could go on and on, but exercise, sleep, all those good things. And now I hope that you can be as present as you can be when you are dealing with your child. And this is hard, but this is one of my tips I always offer, and then I'll go into some of your questions, is ask open-ended questions as opposed to you didn't take your dirty towels down to the laundry. What does that do to most of us, right? Just shuts us down, quiets us down as, um, what's a good example? Someone saying that the kids are refusing to do any schedule. Can you tell me more about that? Like if you say, hey, we're all gonna go for a walk tomorrow at 12 o'clock during lunch break, will they just say no, no, absolutely not? Um, did you want me to answer? Sure. Oh, um, well, I have one child that's refusing to leave the property, the house. So, um, and <laughs> one sleeping, the teen is sleeping later. So, you know, I guess ha they're just refusing. No, we're not going. So then that's where I always say, I invite you to get curious. Right? Instead of getting into the war with them, is get curious. So I'll ask you, why do you think he's afraid to leave the property, he or she? Sorry. He said he's scared of um, getting sick. Right. So that is where you have to start, right? Or I would 
ask you to start because they're beautiful. He's able to articulate. Now, get curious. What do I mean by curious is see if he can, and you can help him tell you exactly sort of what is the story because my guess is he's created a whole storyline in his head of what could happen if he crosses the street or somebody rides by, right? And that's what anxiety is. Anxiety is these amazing stories that we create inside our mind. As the parent of a child who is, I'm not saying he's an anxious child, right now he's having some anxiety, is see if you can help him tell you about it. Oh, are you afraid to cross the street? Again, open-ended questions. Well, how are you comfortable? Is he comfortable going in your backyard? Is he okay? Yeah. yeah. So he's okay in the backyard. So then I would say, oh, so can you help me understand the difference between the backyard and the front yard? Well, there's people walking by. Oh, okay. Well, what if we put our masks on and we keep our masks on and we don't go near the sidewalk? You know, take it slow. No, no, no. What if someone comes up? What if they chase their dog and run onto our lawn? Oh, have you ever seen that happen? Do you think that's likely to happen? Well, what if it does happen? You have your mask on. And hopefully that other person does too, but we don't know that, right? So see what I'm saying? Does that make sense? So instead of it's just this black and white, no. And it's so easy, I don't know about you, but as soon as someone puts down that wall, like, no, I'm not doing it. We, our natural defenses get usually right up. Oh my gosh, what am I gonna do? And then our anxiety, what am I gonna do? He doesn't wanna go outside. And does that make sense? As opposed to use that breath that we started with and be like, okay, let me get curious here, right? And then he might even tell you something you have no idea, like, Maybe he's afraid the UPS man's gonna come while he's outside. Who knows? But if you start with curious, does that sound like, does someone else have um, something, another question, I thought I saw another question. So being present means allowing there to be space for you to not only see your children, but to hear them and hear what they're not even saying, but this was such a good example. Thank you for sharing. So put your phone down. I know we're we all looking at our screens too much, and we'll get to that in a second. But don't talk to your kids, especially about some of this big stuff while your hands in the thing, in the, you know what I mean? <laughs> when you, you have your phone in your hand, because it's sending, guaranteed, it's sending the wrong message. And the kids, my clients, they always tell me that, oh, my mom doesn't really listen to me. She's always on the phone. And of course, we know that you can listen and pay attention to them, but what is the message that you're sending them? So now let's move into what is it that your children really need right now? under this umbrella of so much disappointment, right? So do, are many of you experienced where summer camps have announced that they're closed already? Is that something? So I know the reform movement, Jewish camps have closed. That's been about a month. I just wrote an article, if anyone wants to see it, it's on my website. And that's nancyjkisland.com. I forgot to say that in the beginning. And my article was about summer camps being canceled. And we could substitute summer camps being canceled with baseball practice, soccer practice, theater camp, whatever you want to substitute. The point is that something that your child was really looking forward to has been taken away. And for many of our kids, they've never experienced this kind of cutoff, right? This kind of disappointment. And how, first, I don't know about you, but I'm sure you're pretty disappointed. Like in our house, I have two adult daughters who are living with me right now temporarily. And the day that the reform movement announced that the camps were closed, 
I had just seen it pop up on my Facebook and my older daughter came running down the stairs screaming, mom, mom, something bad has happened. And she comes charging in here. Luckily I wasn't on with a client. She's like, mom, they just closed Eisner for this summer. Now, my daughter's 29 and she hasn't gone to camp in many years since she's been a counselor. But the panic and the sadness was so real and it was so hers because she can empathize with so many kids who feel so disappointed that this, she's like, I don't know what I, and she actually gave me the idea, like, I have to write this article because for many parents, they are so looking forward, I'm sure many of you, looking forward of having your kids in whatever that routine, that schedule is for the summer, right? Now, your disappointments there as well as theirs. So does that ring true for anyone in terms of camp, whether it's overnight camp or just scheduled activities? How are you guys doing with that? How are your kids doing with that? Is that a pretty scary thing? So, um, so if it is, I'll wait and see if there's anything typed in, is how do we help our children with disappointment? whatever it is, how do we help them? And that starts with the fact of letting them have the space to really feel bad. I'll say it again. You don't have to fix it. Guess what? You're off the hook to completely fix their emotion right now. In fact, I urge you to let them, let them have time to grieve, to cry, to scream, like when my daughter came in here and was pacing around and going on and on, I didn't say to her, stop, you're being ridiculous. You don't even go to camp anymore. Ouch, right? That wouldn't feel good. Instead, I joined her where she was and I held space for her to feel and talk it through. Same goes for wherever that disappointment. And I don't know about you, but I know this is something I continue to struggle with, with wearing the mom or the dad hat. I like to be fix it lady, fix it person, right? I want to rush in there and fix it. And every time we rush in to fix it, we are robbing our children of the opportunity to feel their emotions, one, but also to brainstorm, to figure out what they want to do. What are their coping strategies that will help them get through that? Does that make sense? I hope so. So with that is how do we use this time? we have never want it, but how do we use this time to help them build resiliency? So right now your camp isn't canceled. Yay, is that a day camp or a sleepaway camp? And the next question that goes with that, if the day camp is open, the overnight camp is open, both. <laughs> They're both day camp and overnight camp. Are you guys letting your kids go? Do you feel I think that? That's the question, right? I day camp, I think no. Overnight camp, I'm on the fence. Who's talking? I can't see. Oh, Jill? Hi, Jill. Hi. <laughs> So you don't know, uh, so overnight, wait, say it again. So, so day camp, I have little guys, they're five and a half. So they're, they're, they don't, they'll be fine, no day camp. But sleepaway camp, if it's opened, you know, now all of the kids in Montclair that we know are not going to camp. Yeah. But what if my daughter's camp happens? Do I send her to, the, you know, to camp? We all need the break and she needs camp more than anything, but you know, is that responsible? I think in my mind, I go back and forth, like, I'm hoping they make a decision for me, but if they don't, and I have to make that decision, how do you sort of right. make the right decision? Yeah, and, and I think that, at least in the world, the people I'm talking to, that if the camp does open, I'm sure you know the questions to ask, like, what protocols are they taking? Are they taking the temperature? All of those things, and I think every day it feels like, let alone every week, that we're at such a different place. Like two weeks ago, we weren't sort of talking about opening the country. So I don't, I don't know. I, I feel for you guys so much because I don't know. 
It's a hard one. And for someone who worked, I worked at Eisner for 16 summers as the camp therapist. And I went there as a kid. I know what we had to go through to get ready for camp. I know all the training I did with staff before the kids came. I can't even imagine the training that has to go into helping those counselors be prepared to be emotionally available and supportive for your kids. Like what if a kid, someone sneezes and it gets on your daughter and your daughter has a freak out. Your daughter wouldn't be wrong to have a freak out. And the kid who sneezed isn't a bad kid for sneezing, right? So what tools does that 18, 19, 20 year old counselor have to work that through? You know what I mean? That's what I used to do at camp. So that's interesting. Um, I feel like I feel like the need camp for their mental health and everything's been taken away from them. I hear you. It's so, and it's so hard. And what would life look like if they weren't at camp is the question, which helps me transition right into the next piece. So if we go to, whoops, resiliency, sorry. I want to take a little, break and I want you again to focus in on yourself and I want you to just feel what does it feel like when I say the word resilient what does it feel like when I say I want to help you raise a resilient child anyone want to share is it like uncomfortable does it feel like more pressure is on you do you want to like scream at me why is she making me think about resiliency when i can't get my kids off the screen time anyone have a reaction there so with that i'm going to kind of move right into sort of the heart of this what are some and please share what are some of the hardest things that you guys are dealing with right now i saw bedtime I saw getting kids out of the house. I saw sticking to a routine. Anything else? Screen time, a big one. Chat, whoop, here we go. Screen time, schoolwork. Kids refusing to do things. Okay, so first, I want you to imagine that I'm holding a mirror. Nice, pretty, square mirror. I'm holding up in front of you. And I wanted you to take a few seconds to think about what is your reflection? What do you look like to your children when you are trying to get them to follow routines, to get their schoolwork done, to get out of the house? What do you think that you look like to your child? And what are you seeing in this imaginary mirror. So what do you think? Are you seeing someone who yells all the time? Are you seeing someone who's not being effective, that you just don't have the power, that something happened during this crazy lockdown and you lost your power? Is that, are you feeling miserable? Someone said a miserable mom. So that's why I love doing these very controlling, angry, stressed, guilty, and seeing all these words, right? And that's why I can give you all these great ideas, at least I think they're great ideas, of things you can do with your kids. But if I don't really focus on how you're doing and what you need, I wish I could give you all big hugs and say it's going, it's going to be okay because we are going to get through this. It's how can I help you let go of some of that, oh my gosh, I have to do this. So now if you could tell me, what is the biggest pressure right now? Is it the kids getting the schoolwork done? Is it getting the screen time away? Let's see, schoolwork, screen time, bedtime. Is it those three? Screen time, reducing screens. That's always screen time. Okay. So let's talk about screen time. Just not knowing screen time and bedtime. And I think screen time and bedtime go together, no matter what age. So I'm gonna give you my real quick parenting 101, and it's going to lead right into screen time. So here's my quick tips. One is 
have a family meeting. Now, more than ever, have a family meeting. I always recommend doing, doing Sunday night before the week starts, even though the week is different now. It's a good, you know, let's end the week. And after dinner, you can sit together, maybe have a nice dessert. Someone, you have your notepad. Maybe you ask one of your kids to be the secretary and take the notes. And I want you to talk about, oh my goodness, do you guys see this? <laughs> There's a very big bug flying around. <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> so I want you to have a planned agenda. If you have a partner, come up with your agenda uh, ahead of time. Okay, I want to talk about screen times with the kids. I want to talk about chores. I'm just making this up. Don't bring every complaint, every horrible thing your kids have ever done to this meeting. Start small. Two things. Screen time. Chores. That might be enough. And talk about it. And again, don't go in like you are the boss and you're going to fire everyone if they don't do what they say. Remember what I said curiosity. I want you to be curious. So I'm going to use my little prop here. Here's my phone. And I want everyone to bring their phone to the table this one time. And you could say, hey, everybody, let's go to that page. It's in settings that we can see how many hours we've been on the phone. Do you guys all know that? There's a page in settings and it breaks down exactly the usage. So, oh no, I don't want to go there. No, no, I am empowering you right now that you have the power to do it. My guess is you pay for the phones in the house. You pay for the technology. Work. You're not snooping. You're not doing it behind your children's back. You're not even going to punish them for it. We are all gathering information. You are now in charge of gathering information. So you take your pen and you say, okay, Hannah, how many hours have you, yours? Oh, it says you've been on Netflix today for three hours. You've been on TikTok today for six. And it looks like the average use of time is 15 hours a day. You don't throw up. You don't scream, you don't start to cry. Because any of you who have middle school or over, I'm um, the average middle schooler, especially middle school girl, is spending 12 to 15 hours a day, a day on screen time. I did this exercise a week ago with a family, uh, the parents, because I was very worried about the kids. So after her session, I made the parents find the time to talk with me. And I did that little exercise. And the parent, one of them just fought. Gosh, no, I know how much, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. So I was like, just humor me. And he opens and he's like, my daughter spends six hours a day on TikTok for the last two weeks. And so I quickly pulled out my calculator and I added up and I helped him figure out, basically, I can't do it this fast right now, but how many months of his daughter's life if you, if you spend on? It used to be before lockdown that if you gave me a middle school boy, I could promise you that he was spending eight to nine hours a day gaming on technology, doing something. Eight to nine hours a day comes out to three and a half, roughly, months of some child's life lost in this device. So 15 hours a day. Are any of you guys shocked by that? No. Yes? Yes. No. <laughs> so here's the thing. Knowledge is power. So yes, we're in lockdown. Yes, I am the first to say your teenagers, your middle schoolers, they need those devices to socialize. But what's the limit? And here's where you need to help at that family meeting, have, start having these conversations and have boundaries. Use the word boundaries, use the word structure, whatever works for you. But kids actually feel better when they're structured. They feel safe.
And what do we all know right now is that none of us feel safe, really safe, like the way we did a couple months ago. So now more than ever, your kids need to know they're as safe as you can keep them. So how do you do that? You, one, I say this all the time and I hope it's not annoying to any of you, but please have all devices stored outside the bedroom. I don't care if your kid tells you they use it as an alarm clock, buy them an alarm clock. Store them in your bedroom because a big thing right now with my middle schoolers and my high schoolers are, they say that they, maybe they start with plugging them in in the kitchen and then after the parents go to sleep, they go downstairs, they pick up the phone, they go to the basement and they hang out on house party. If you guys know house party, house party is one of the big ones where like right now we're on a Zoom call and we hope it's secure and we publicize the link. House party, let's say we were all, I invite you all to join me on the house party, 12 o'clock tonight, be there. The problem is we all think that it's private, but they're not private. And the thing is that they invite enough people where they get so silly and carried away that they don't know that somebody else, an intruder, entered into their house party. And they're doing things that we want them to be doing. We want them to be laughing. We want them to be socializing. But then they're doing things that um, maybe shouldn't be done with a stranger. Like they might be playing truth or dare or a new game these days is paranoia. Has anyone heard of paranoia? Paranoia is truth or dare on steroids, I call it. It's like, and so it might be like, you have to take your shirt off and all these kinds of things, i.e. remember what I just said about intruders. So what I find myself asking parents to please talk to their kids about is the privacy issue. Is, and even if it is just your group of friends and boys and girls, or doesn't have to be same sex, and you take off your shirt, you don't know who's videotaping you on the other eye, right? You don't know who's taking, snapshot. So that whole idea of privacy. So let's go back to screen time at the family meeting. I urge you to set a limit and only you know what that limit, that hours are for your family. People ask me this all the time. How many hours do I think are okay? Well, um, I used to say never before the age two and now I wish I could say never before the age three. American Pediatrics, when I was researching for my book, had just changed their recommendation from two years, no screens in front of a child before the age of two. I took this class and they said they actually changed it to 18 months because they felt that parents wouldn't listen to them if they said two years. So against their findings, they pushed it back. Can you imagine? To 18 months. So with that, you know, we're not talking about the little ones, let's say five and older. Really less than two hours other than school time. And I'm sure some of you want to scream at me, but we all somehow grew up doing things without screens. And I don't include TV in the screen anymore, do you? But I feel like all of a sudden, TV has become a good thing, right? Now, like, oh, just let them watch TV. And when I say watch TV, I urge you to let, like, siblings watch together. You as a family watch together. Um, because then you have that sibling interaction. You have dialogue. It's that thought of each child sitting on their phone, their device alone, that I believe is so unhealthy. And I don't know if you guys have researched this, and I have lots of this information in my book, but we know that too much screen time, especially in the developing brain, alters the gray matter. And what does that mean? That means that it's harder for a child to self-regulate, impulse control, attention span, all kinds of things that we really want our kids. So let me take a little pause and see if you guys have any questions because the time's going by so fast and I wanna make sure I get to your questions. 
So type in some questions and I'll try and answer ones I saw. So back to the family meeting, let's say you and your partner have come up with, okay, you'll allow five hours of screen time. Instead of just demanding, hey, Charlie, you can only have five hours, I would weave it in a different kind of conversation. Hey, just like we're giving you $100, where do you want to spend it? Or do you want to bank some time for a special project? Oh, do you want to bank it because you want to play with your buddies in two days? Okay, so you can bank some time. So again, you're inviting them to join you in the conversation as opposed to coming down. What does that sound? Screen time limit is a struggle. Um, I am a big believer in rewards. Not, I try not to bribe with food or money, but if you have to do one, money is better than food. <laughs> and create a jar like we used to have I don't have one here but um the cursing jar when when everybody was at that stage and anytime someone cursed they had to put a quarter in the cursing jar did it work i don't know but it was enough of annoyance that it raised their level of consciousness about it so maybe it did work <laughs> you know so screen time Okay, if I have to tell you three times, you pick the number, if I have to tell you three times to get off your device, I'm just going to turn off the Wi-Fi. Or maybe you can't do that because someone else in the house is working. I'm going to, you're going to lose it for two days. But here's the extra challenge. And again, this is so personal for every family, but I like the consequence to not be a device. So think of other consequences. For a consequence to work, it has to mean something to the child, right? So uh, a lot of times families will say to me, well, my kid has no money, so I can't do the money thing. Well, okay, start giving, start giving an allowance. And it doesn't have to be a lot of money. And have chores. So chores and allowance to me go together, chores, allowance. You want to get money, you need to do some chores. Not that you pay your child for the chore, but it's a good coming of age thing. So tell me, how many of you all have your kids doing chores? Is that like a very outdated thing? I find people, yay for you, yay. Yes, good. How about allowance? Do you all do allowance? small ones good yes so when it comes to consequences a great conversation is to help and engage your child in the conversations let's think of something us as the family could do together that we want to do oh, okay we want to you know we want to build that shed or we want to build a tree house or we want to camp overnight in the backyard something that you can engage them in then you have a consequence. And I know there's no perfect answer to this, but the key to all this is to pull them into the problem with you as opposed to you telling them it's a problem that they're on devices. Because I promise you where we are now at the end of May, the kids that I've been working with who have had almost no limits, like literally no limits with their devices, they are the first one to get on the phone and say, Nancy, I'm in trouble. I had three girls last week. Nancy, I'm in trouble. I can't get out of bed. All I do is sit on the phone. I fight with my friends all the time. And the kicker here is you would think that they're spending all this time in these group texts, that they're getting closer with each other, that they're having these intimate conversations. But you know what we're finding, and I've read so much about this, after I started seeing it in my practice is our kids are lonelier than ever. They're lonely because they're not able to see their friends. They're not able to go to school, but they're not really skilled at having intimate conversations because their tool bag that we talked about a while ago, that tool bag isn't really full of many tools that can help them be that resilient self. So how do we help them? Be resilient, we have firm cutoff times. That phone goes. If you're the parent and your kid is sneaking out to go on a house party, 
I wouldn't take it away completely. I would invite them to talk to you about it and then be like, you know what, Friday night, no school the next day, Friday night, I'm good if you go on 12 to two, but two is the absolute latest. And you know what, we're gonna check tomorrow, the next day, and we're gonna look at your phone together. How does that sound? So now I, I was wondering if maybe we should, um, we should scoot back to the younger age kids and kind of focus on that. Is that good? Because I'm seeing there's a lot. Oh wait, there's a couple comments about allowance. We always forget about allowance. My seven year old doesn't seem to care about money or buying things, which is awesome. But then you can use the money as a, a tool, a teachable moment of not only do we use the money as something to buy for ourselves, we can use the money and we could donate to the food pantry because there's other children who really do need things. Because I love that they don't want it, so, so flip it. You know, there are kids, especially right now, who don't have enough. So we're gonna use our money. I'm gonna put in $10. Can you put in a dollar, right? That is that such a, such a great partnership. Hi. <laughs> Hi, those are the faces that make my day. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so any other questions while I get myself back on track? Um, how is this feeling? Does, is this helpful? I always hate when I can't see all your faces out there. Um, let's see, is there any questions I haven't addressed? Let me take a peek. Um, sometimes big emotions, big emotions in little people, right? Is that something that a lot of us are having? And some, it might be temper tantrums, it might be screaming, it might be crying, it might be, oh, I just rushed, my brother just hit the side of my hand and I'm going to die, it's so bad. It's like these hyper dramatic. Right? That, again, both take those couple of deep breaths, come into your body, get curious. What's, what's really going on, right? How can you help your child express it? And these are some of my tricks there is, you can ask, can I help you find a word to describe how you're feeling? No. Can I help you find a sound? How about if we try to come together and find a sound that helps you describe? Does it sound like, ah, does it sound like, Rrr? and kind of go through it. And in there, one, you're helping put a sound to a feeling, and you're giving space for that feeling, but you're also creating a space for laughter and laughing at self, which is such an important thing in that resiliency piece. So coming up also, I'm just so angry or I'm just so sad. In my office, I always have big pillows and punch a pillow. Put the pillow on a couch, pick a pillow you don't love and let your child say, let me see how angry you are. Why don't you punch the pillow? Most of us get uncomfortable with that <laughs> or it's like scary. But once the kid breaks through that, or you can take the lead and you punch the pillow first and then let, it can be a really healing. I do it with kids and adults. So it's, it's creating space and not having a set plan in your mind of what it should look like. Uh, how does that sound? And then the other, we talked about journaling, um, spending time in nature, you know what? You seem so angry and just so frustrated. You know what helps me? Let's go sit in the backyard or let's go take a walk around or let's just go take a walk around the backyard. Let's see what new flowers we can find because nature so helps ground us and sort of takes away some of like, oh God, I'm so locked up here in this. Uh, does, that, does that help for that question at all? Um, I feel, I almost feel like we need a kid version of the college dorm. Yes, that's good, that's good. Um, what will we do all summer if camp is canceled and parents are working? 
that is the big, oh, my heart just breaks for you guys because that's the hardest. And I know, and I am um, collecting resources and putting them on my website is again I'm sound like an idiot because I'm just told you to stay away from screens but there are some really cool things that are people are putting out like have you seen um, museums you can go into museums the kid-friendly museums I think uh, it's the San Diego Zoo things like that so I can we can keep up on that and I don't know um, you guys can just keep going to my website and see what updated. And also, if you go to my website, nancyjkisslin.com, you can let me know if you like my new website. But also, we just, just put it up last week. Um, if you sign up, you will get a free ebook, small little ebook. And it is actually part of my mindfulness chapter in lockdown. And I found that in my book, Lockdown, I spent so much time researching so many years doing mindfulness work. And I believe that teaching children how to use their breath, how to be conscious of their body. And I give all these little techniques that I won't talk about now, but are really good for the young all the way on up. So just go in, sign in, and you'll get a free download of that. And also, I'll send out periodically updates because I think that is probably one of the hardest hardest things. Thank you. Um, any other questions that we didn't get the, um, and maybe we do this again over the summer if you guys want, but the big question is, how do I help my child? How do I help me get ready to let my child go back into the world? And that could be a whole nother program, right? Because that's going to be a lot of, hey, how am I feeling about that? And then how do I help my child? Does that mean I'm going to give them a backpack of masks and gloves and Perel? How do I measure that level of anxiety with his or her mental health? So I would love to say that if you guys are okay with that with, with entering. Um, but I think even if we take that one step back is, have any of you been going into the grocery stores or stores like even Target with your kids? I personally haven't gotten into stores, but I imagine even the first time you bring a child into Target or the grocery store, there's going to need to be some very conscious talks. Like these, this is what mommy and daddy are doing to stay safe. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. And just staying mindful. Sorry. Do you see the bug flying? <laughs> um, and maybe that's a good place to take a pause is just remembering that we will get through this, that we do have a sense of humor, and that in a way there's so many beautiful gifts. I don't know if you all are seeing. Okay. Um, hold on, I am covering the bug. <laughs> I stopped it. Um, that's what I get for working 16 summers at an overnight camp. Aren't you impressed that I didn't scream the whole time? And it was a loss, but we're okay. <laughs> so tell me, do you guys have any, oh, someone said, um, question about kids snacking and sneaking food. That's a, that's a great question and an interesting question because, again, it, to me, what I hear is schedules all off, routines all off. What does our schedule look like? And maybe that is something you bring up at your family meeting and you don't come at it with judgment, criticizing, more of, you know, this is really important that we all contribute to creating a healthy lifestyle, a healthy family. And here are some of the things that help us stay healthy. And here are some of the behaviors we're gonna work on that make staying healthy that much more challenging. So you're, and the most important thing there is taking that judgment away from it. That helps a little bit. Anybody have any other questions out there? 
gosh, the time goes really fast. I don't know about you guys, but on this end, yeah, very good. Is this helpful? Yeah. So we have people leaving. So as they're getting ready to leave, I just want to say thank you. Please feel free to always email me questions. I've been doing lots of these webinars and the beautiful thing about these Zoom calls webinars is it doesn't matter where we're doing, everyone's always invited. So if someone, tomorrow I'm actually doing one on screen time, it's called the internet is raising our kids. So I go for an hour, I have a lot more research and if anyone wants to join, just email me or go on my Facebook page, Nancy Kislin. And uh, you can see the Zoom. I'll, I think that one I have to email you the Zoom invite. That's at four o'clock tomorrow. So I apologize for my following wallpaper. Highly recommend not buying the stick up your own wallpaper yourself. <laughs> and uh, any other questions? Like, I think I got them all. Nancy, I think um, Eleanor from uh, Montclair Bounce is going to say a few words. Sure. Hi, um, Aaron. Thank you. And Nancy, thank you so much. Um, that was fascinating. And Karen, Karen, who's part of the bounce team too, Karen Greenwald, and helped uh, organize this. Uh, I think it's a great uh, offering. Um, I wanted to just say that Montclair Bounce started as a festival last year. Mm -hmm. uh, we've pivoted to um, trying to offer what we can to the community online. It was a festival of optimism and resilience. Um, hmm. um, and resilience is something that you spoke a lot about. Um, it's been called stealth mental health. And the idea is there are many things we can do that are good for our toolkit, um, resilience toolkit that are also very rewarding, whether it's arts, education, uh, connecting with community. So we do have month-to-month um, -month offerings online um, for all ages. Uh, we had comic drawing, we have quarantine cooking, we have mindfulness also. Um, and we will have um, a book talk about Flint, Michigan coming up. Um, it's not announced yet, but oh. a young adult book and also um, Actually, next week we have a jazz story time by some wonderful jazz artists um, next Thursday night. So uh, check us out, MontclairBounce.org, but we are thrilled to partner with Near to Mead. Once again, we, we started our online events in March, actually, or yeah. it was in April with um, an interfaith uh, conversation on loneliness, which uh, with Rabbi Katz and some um, local ministers. So we're, if you have ideas, please reach out um, of things that you would like to see. Um, Nancy, if you would like to do this again in partnership, um, Aaron and Karen, uh, we'd love to do that. Um, and that's it. Thank you so much. Oh, uh, yes. I'm actually sent uh, attaching a link. If you um, would like to just fill out a brief form give for feedback, um, you don't have to share your email or you can, and then we can keep you posted on events, but I just shared the link there. It's a Google Drive form, very easy. Um, that's it. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for everything you're doing for your wonderful communities. It's beautiful. Okay, I think Nancy, thank you so much again for being with us and you know, near to me. It's, it's wonderful to get to see you again this year. And I want to thank, give a special thank you to, to Karen Greenwald for putting together this event because I think, you know, it's so important that we all come together in these times, you know, even if it's virtually. Yeah, so nice to see you all again. And you, I'm so impressed with your community, really, and everything you all do. And I'm sure you're just make time for yourself, take a break, and we're gonna get through this. Right? <laughs> yeah. I, take care. Thank you. Thanks so much. Be well. Bye, Nancy. Bye. Bye. Bye.